So as you all know, in 2019, Governor Lamont signed into law the Paid Leave Act. In January of this year, employers began collecting a half a percent of pay from workers to fund the Paid Leave Contribution Trust Fund. And that fund will begin to pay benefits in 2022. The first of those contributions were due by April 30th of this year. Today, we can report that more than 108,000 businesses have registered with the Paid Leave Authority, and we have collected approximately $102 million in employee contributions to the Paid Leave Trust Fund in the first quarter. Reaching this milestone would not have been possible without Governor Ned Lamont's vision and the collective commitment of Connecticut's workers, businesses, the Paid Leave Authority Board of Directors, the extraordinary staff at the Paid Leave Authority, and the unerring support of Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz, Congresswoman DeLauro, and the advocates who have worked tirelessly to make paid leave a reality. Right now, I would like to invite Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz to the podium to make some remarks. Well, good afternoon, Andrea. Thank you so much for your incredible leadership. It is my honor to be here to highlight and celebrate this very significant milestone of 108,000 businesses registering for our landmark paid family medical leave program, especially less than a year uh, after standing up this program. Not only did the Paid Family Medical Leave Authority meet their goal of registering 104,000 businesses, they surpassed it. This law, which was passed during the 2019 legislative session, will provide up to 12 weeks of replacement wages for workers who take extended time off to have a baby, to care for uh, a family member with an illness, or to take care of a loved one. So COVID-19, has really laid bare so many inequities in our society, um, especially the lack of access to quality health care. Um, and we cannot defeat the spread of the virus unless we give people the opportunity to have the ability to take time off, to uh, care for themselves, to get over the virus, or to quarantine or isolate. We needed paid family medical leave long before the COVID pandemic, but it's really underscored this critical program, which so many people uh, would have um, taken the opportunity to use had it been in place. So that's why I'm very excited today uh, to announce this milestone because the program is up and running and we are very soon going to be able to take advantage of the benefits of it. Our work has made Connecticut one of the most female-friendly states in the country, according to Wallet Hub. So now that our businesses have registered, it's up to all of us to educate and inform our workforce that this program is available and uh, to let people know that they have the opportunity to use it. And I want to give a sh special shout out to our legislative partners, Robin Porter and State Senator Julie Kushner, without the help of these uh, incredible legislators, this would not have become a reality. So uh, Andrea and your team, congratulations, uh, and thank you so much for letting me say a couple of words. Thank you very much. We do have a few people who are, will be making remarks today, so I'll just let you know that in advance. Uh, first, I have to thank the many, many agencies and people who helped make today's milestone possible. First, I'd like to thank the Department of Administrative Services and Commissioner Josh Cabal and everyone at the Department of Administrative Services who made paid leave possible by allowing our agency to start from scratch. We're very grateful to you for your support. Virtually every state agency played a role in making paid leave possible, but there are a few who work with us almost daily to make our agency a reality and make paid leave a reality for these people of Connecticut. And I'd like to thank them today. They are the Office of Policy and Management, the Department of Labor, the Department of Revenue Services, the Office of the Treasurer, the Office of the State Controller, the Department of Aging and, Debil and Disability Services, and the Department of Economic and Community Development. 
We also had a number of vendor partners that helped us build our website, and I'd like to thank them today. They are Slalom, that built the website, registration, and the payment platforms, as well as Salesforce, their IT and our IT partner as well. United Way 211 played a critical role in supporting those who were registering by providing superior customer support. Miranda Creative for their partnership in our communications and the National Payroll Consortium, which represents thousands and thousands of employers, and they facilitated the registration and the remittances of the contribution to the pay leave authority. We are also fortunate to have an outstanding board of directors that is chaired by the state's chief operating officer, Josh Cabal. And I'd like to introduce him now and ask him to come to the podium. All right, thank you, Andrea, and um, good afternoon. Um, I, uh, I remember that when the governor and lieutenant governor asked me to take on the role as chair of this uh, board of this quasi uh, about a year and a half ago, the, the first meeting I had was with uh, Senator Kushner and Representative Porter, and I remember very clearly sitting down with them, and we were reflecting on how aggressive the timelines were that had been set out in the statute to stand up this authority. Um, but that how important it was that we did everything we possibly could to hit those deadlines because the need for paid leave in Connecticut is so great. And I think with the, uh, the experience of the pandemic, that's only further solidified our view of how important this program is. And so just very briefly, I want to recognize the people who have who've made this progress possible. Uh, first and foremost, it's Andrea Barton Reeves, our, our CEO. Um, you know, they say the first and most important role of a board of directors is to hire the CEO. Uh, and by that measure, uh, our board gets an A plus uh, because she has uh, done an amazing job, has assembled a small but mighty team that has been doing really incredible work, even in the midst of the pandemic, uh, to stay on track. Um, so hats, hats off to you and the team for a tremendous job done so far. Um, secondly, I, I want to compliment the governor uh, and lieutenant governor and the legislature for their wisdom as well to set this up as a quasi-public agency. I think this is it illustrated very clearly the value of that model in state government to be able to move quickly, to be nimble, to attract top talent, uh, and to do really hard things in a short amount of time. And I think this is a very clear example of why the design here was so important. Uh, to that end, I would just mention there are a couple bills um, rattling around in the building in back of me right now that would seek to yoke our quasis with significant additional rules and bureaucracy, and I think this is just a good reminder of why we don't want to do that. We want to keep these organizations nimble, ability to move fast, and to do uh, such important work for the people of Connecticut. Um, last thing I would just say is I want to thank our board of directors, uh, several of whom are standing behind me right now. If they could just raise their hands, uh, and those who aren't here as well, um, particularly those who are not state employees serving on this board. It's a significant time commitment. They've brought a tremendous amount of expertise and, and heart to the work of the board, and I'm very grateful for their service. So thank you very much. The success of this program would not be possible without the willingness of Connecticut businesses. And as I mentioned earlier, 108,000 businesses have registered with the Pay Leave Authority. Today we have one of those businesses, Doug Barber of Burke and Blends, and he will speak to his commitment of and the importance of the paid leave program. Good, after good afternoon. I uh, thank you for having me here. Um, my wife and I own Burke and Blends Cafe. We have one location across the street here in Hartford and one in Glastonbury. And I can't tell you, I'm sure you're aware of how the struggles that we've endured over the past year with the COVID crisis. Um, we strive as employers to offer them all the support that we can offer them, but we certainly have a lot of limitations. And this program um, is certainly something that will help. And we're grateful to the state of Connecticut and the authority for putting this program together that is going to allow us to support our employees, but also they made it so it's the least painful for the small businesses in the area. So we appreciate that. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, although I don't see either Senator Kushner uh, nor Representative Porter here today, I do want to personally thank them for their really unwavering support of the paid leave program, the fight that they put up for many years. And to see the program come to fruition today, I'm sure is a proud moment for them. They are, in fact, doing the other parts of their jobs, and, but I recognize them and thank them for all their support. Next, though, I'd like to introduce Maddie Granato from the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, 
one of the leaders of the advocacy coalition who fought for paid leave, Maddie. My name is Madeline Granado, and I'm the policy director for the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, or QUELF. Uh, first, I just want to thank Andrea um, and her team for all of their amazing work to get us here today to this important milestone. Um, I'd also like to thank Governor Lamont and Lieutenant Governor Beisowitz for their unwavering support to paid leave um, throughout what was a very difficult few years. Um, thank you, of course, to Senator Kushner and Representative Porter um, for continuing their leadership um, on paid leave long after the bill passed. Um, as mentioned, Quelf leads the Campaign for Paid Family Leave, a coalition of more than 75 organizations that fought for and won passage of paid leave um, in 2019. Today, I'm so proud to be here and to celebrate this milestone and just see how close we are to making paid family medical leave a reality here in our state. Prior to the pandemic, we heard year after year how critical access to paid family medical leave was to women in our state, especially women of color. We heard the stories of new parents who returned to work too soon after giving birth, and from those who struggled to be there for a terminally ill family member. We heard from women in the sandwich generation, stuck between the needs of dependent children, aging relatives, and a 40 plus hour work week. We made the case then that paid leave is a necessary policy to support workers and their families. Now I think most of us can agree, paid family medical leave is absolutely essential. When lawmakers passed this policy in 2019, no one could have predicted um, a global pandemic and the severe social and economic burdens it would place on workers, especially women, and their families in our state. Since the pandemic began, we know that women, again, especially women of color, have suffered the most severe impacts of COVID that could erase a generation of progress towards gender equity. Women are overrepresented in low-wage jobs, on the front lines of the crisis, and in industries that have experienced the highest layoffs. Women have filed the majority of unemployment claims and have left the workforce at staggering rates. The COVID-19 crisis has made abundantly clear, workers should never face the impossible choice between their health, the health of a loved one, and their paycheck. Successful implementation of paid leave in our state is critical to how we recover long-term from this pandemic. Um, again, I'm so grateful to Andrea and her team, um, as well as the Lamont administration for all of their incredible work, again, despite a very challenging year, um, to make this moment um, just really a reality and to celebrate this milestone. We're so proud and, and excited to continue to work alongside you. Um, thank you. I'd like to read just a brief statement from AARP before I introduce the governor. Paid family and medical leave makes a big difference in the lives of working caregivers. No one should have to choose between a paycheck and taking care of someone they love when they're most in need. AARP Connecticut supports our, our state's paid leave and paid family and medical leave program and looks forward to seeing the difference it will make in the lives of caregivers and their loved ones. And now I would like to introduce to you Governor Led, Led Lamont. Governor Lamont has always held a vision that our state can be made better when businesses and workers come together to contribute to a, a vibrant state economy. Governor, with your vision and support, paid family medical leave is now a reality in the state of Connecticut. We are poised to help thousands of working families and build a stronger economy, and we all thank you. Governor? Well, thank you, Andrea. It's really important, and it has been a long time coming. And uh, Connecticut has always been a leader. It was our very own uh, Senator Chris Dodd who took the lead with unpaid leave back in the 90s. And uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro has been a champion for a paid family and medical leave. And uh, it took a while. And uh, we got it passed here in Connecticut. It's one of the most uh, progressive and ambitious uh, paid family and medical leave in the country. And a lot of that, as you've heard, is thanks to the um, unyielding support and uh, advocacy from uh, Robin and Julie and our friends in the legislature to make this happen. And it, more important than ever, I mean, Doug, I, I came out of small business as well. And the big guys I was competing with, you know, AT&T, Verizon, they all had programs like this. Um, and I, as a small business, we had to find ways that we can compete, find ways that we could take care of our, um, our employees, men, women, single parents who uh, maybe had an issue, medical, 
um, first time kid and do everything we could to take care of them. I wish we had had that program when I had my business going. I think you're going to find it really is an important program. And Maddie, as you said, for especially women, especially women as we've learned over this last 12 months, what it means for those kids at home. I mean, even, even Donald Trump came forward with paid a medical leave this last year. Who would have thunk it? And because he realized this public health that emergencies we've been going through reminded us how important it is from a public health point of view that if you were sick, if you had flu-like symptoms, they may be COVID, you could not fear for your job and I had to go to work rather than stay at home. We gave you all the incentives to do the right thing for your health, your family's health, and the public health going forward. And as you heard um, from Andrea and Patty, um, you know, women have been disproportionately hurt by this uh, COVID economy. We got to do everything we can to make it easier for them to get back to work and uh, make sure that a paid family and medical leave uh, gives them a little more of that opportunity going forward. What this means for kids at the starting line of life is so important. And uh, these are all the commitments uh, we're making as we learn uh, coming out of COVID. And I'd like to follow up on something that uh, Josh said. Whenever government does something big and bold, there are a lot of folks on the sidelines hoping we fail. And just as an example of saying, oh, government can't get anything right. And you heard that a lot during the early days of paid family and medical leave. And we put this together really carefully and started with the very best people who could to lead it. And that's uh, Josh, our COO, and Andrea, the CEO of this, and an amazing board. And I want to thank you. I mean, sometimes, you know, a board helps us get the expertise we need. We can't always find within um, state government. And working together, we got an amazing board. And not only did we meet all of the hurdles we had in terms of numbers of business signed up and how much money we had to raise, we exceeded that. So we're on track to get this going on January 1 um, in a real way. I was sort of struck. Our friends in the legislature kindly gave us up the $50 million from IT capital spend so we could get this done. Andrea told me we're probably going to be able to do it at 12 or 13. This is all a way of trying to say progressive government works. We can make a difference in people's lives. We can do it in an efficient and cost-effective way that makes an enormous difference. And I'm really proud that Connecticut's, uh, again, continuing to take the lead. And I really hope Joe Biden in Washington, D.C. follows us soon along. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Governor. That actually uh, concludes the more formal portion of our program. I want to thank you all for coming today, and we can open the floor for some questions. Yeah, so we're measuring the compliance rate against the number of businesses who are registered to pay unemployment insurance with the Department of Labor, and that number is 108,000. It is, yes, it is. I knew you would ask me that. So, <laughs> uh, we're, so we, we measure the numbers in big groups. So we've got, we think we're about a half a million, maybe a little bit less than that. But I want to double check and get those numbers for you. I should probably let Josh and Andrea handle this. Let's see what comes out of the federal government. I'm glad they're um, you know, following the lead of Connecticut and a number of other states. If our plan is better and they allow us to keep our plan, um, we would probably like to do that in exchange. But I think there's a lot of um, speed bumps along the way. Do you have anything to add there? I do. We don't know very much about the details of the federal law right now. The two things that we do know that are uh, different than our law is that they propose to offer some coverage for bereavement, which isn't something that's currently covered in our law. 
uh, and our law provides uh, for up to 12 days of leave for domestic violence. And while that is covered pur uh, purportedly by the federal law, we don't know what that length of leave might be. So we'll have to wait until the legislation is actually written and published, and we can have an opportunity to do a more substantive analysis in comparison. Yeah, so I think you're asking me about how many, pro how many businesses actually enrolled in a private plan, which was an option under the statute. And there were 262 businesses that enrolled in a private plan. They submitted an application on time, they met all of the criteria that we set for a private plan, and their private plans were approved. Most of those plans were with smaller businesses of 20 employees or fewer. There were a few that were large. Uh, but the majority of those were actually small businesses that I'm actually proud to say, even though they're not in the public plan, that they were, they were already offering some form of paid family medical leave and wanted to continue that for their employees, which is exactly what we're looking for, is for to have employees covered by paid leave. Were, were any private plans that there were some private plans that did not meet the criteria. They either did not submit their application on time, there are criteria to hold a vote in a specific way, in some instances those were not met, but even if the private plan was not approved in the first cycle, uh, businesses do have the ability to reapply and meet those criteria if they choose to do so. They, some of them have reapplied immediately after the deadline, which was March 30th, they reapplied, uh, and they will probably get approval. We're, we were approving plans within 14 days to 30 days. The number of plans that did not make the cut was about 60. Well, first of all, um, when it comes to paid family medical leave, I think a lot of those people who are protesting are going to be the ones who are going to directly benefit from what we're trying to do here, what that means for uh, their kids and what that means for our families. You know, overall, as, as you know, Christine, we've been rolling out what the $6 billion in federal funding is going to mean for the social safety net, what that means for kids from the, um, you know, infancy right through to workforce development in high school, those type of investments we want to make to get this state going again, and make sure we don't leave anybody uh, behind. And I see no reason to raise taxes to raise taxes when we're going to show that we have the resources to get the job done on behalf of people that um, need our help. Well, paid family medical leave is an insurance program that people are getting themselves their own insurance so they can be taken care of. You know, TCI, as you know, is really key in terms of environmental quality and also shoring up our transportation fund, paid uh, predominantly by the middlemen who, uh, you know, purchased the, uh, you know, gasoline. But look, I'm not interested in, um, you know, we, we've got pretty good revenues right now. We're in a very strong position as a state. We have a three plus billion dollars in our rainy day fund. This is no time to be, um, you know, talking about a need to raise taxes when we really ought to be focused on investing the money that we have to make the biggest difference in people's lives. Which again is why I'm so proud of what Andrea and the um, authorities have been able to do to show that we can invest this money appropriately, timely, and efficiently. Hey, Josh, when are state workers going to go back to the office? <laughs> so, first of all, uh, many state workers never left the job. We have, you know, a huge percentage of the state workforce is we're essential workers working in our correctional facilities, our hospitals. Um, so we, we need to acknowledge them first and foremost in answering this question. Beyond that, our office-based employees, um, many of them have been going into the office. Our offices have been open um, since, I think, phase two of reopening last summer. Um, but we, you know, as we go head towards um, the 19th here, we are looking at um, you know, how we can continue to increase capacity in our offices where it makes sense or where we want to continue to leverage telecommuting 
um, as we have done throughout the pandemic, if we can stay completely productive, uh, meeting our, uh, our missions and our respective agencies. Okay, well that, that shouldn't be happening under any circumstances. So if there are specific concerns, you know, they should reach out to us and we'll help them get addressed. In terms of uh, you, you mentioned jobs, but you also call it the message tonight too. So there going to be some decision made and announced prior to tonight or on the nineteenth next thirty days when No, I mean there's no capacity restrictions on office buildings no. generally in the state of Connecticut right now, whether it's any of these buildings or whether it's any of the, the state's buildings. So it's just a journey that we're all on as you know, all of our different agencies. Um, you know, at what points in time we want to bring more people in the office, if that's helpful in terms of our agencies and our agency heads meeting their goals and objectives. Um, but it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be any dramatic changes on the 19th. What I've heard about it is that it may not be isolated. I've heard about incidents like this at other facilities around the country. And I think uh, it's the worst of what we're all about. And uh, I'm really glad that people are standing up at outrage at uh, what those symbols meant. And I think it was purposeful and it was wrong. And we don't stand for that in Connecticut. Want to add to that, Susan? Yeah, uh, I'll just say that there's been you know, over the past couple of years, there's been a, a very disturbing increase in signs of hate in our state, whether it's been on the Yukon campus or in Amazon, uh, and th th those kinds of symbols, that kind of hate is not something that we uh, condone. We have very strong hate crime laws in our state, and, um, you know, I hope that our law enforcement um, officials will uh, keep a close eye. Um, and I just ask our residents to be kind to one another and, and tolerant. Oh, absolutely. Um, when it comes to those summer school programs, when it comes to summer learning, the summer learning camps, uh, you know, we're using our uh, federal allocation to help uh, subsidize those camps. There's also significant resources going right to the local superintendents of schools. So federal support, again, to get the summer programs going, the learning programs going, free access to our museums and aquariums, and a lot of really good programs with kids get back to school in the fall. That will all be federally supported and state supported. Thanks, everybody.